Okay, we're live, great. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us on our second uh, webinar of the Circular Economy. Um, we really appreciate you having you here. Um, we have a really great lineup tonight to talk about data and design in the circular economy. And we are really looking forward to our four amazing speakers who are joining us tonight. And we're going to be, uh, this whole discussion is going to be moderated by uh, Charmy and Love, who is our academic advisor at the Said Business School. So again, just wanted to give uh, an introduction to the Circular Economy Lab for anyone who is tuning in for the first time and who might not be familiar with the Circular Economy Lab. So we have three main goals that we're trying to achieve within this lab, which is incubating within the Said Business School at Oxford. The first is to deepen awareness and understanding of the circular economy and what circularity means, both within the University of Oxford and beyond. The second is to create a link between academics and practitioners. We have, um, as I was mentioning last week, if you're tuning in, um, a great amount of great resources being done in the academic sphere on circularity, but often there's kind of a disconnect between practitioners who have a really deep understanding of um, circularity, but aren't necessarily speaking with um, academics in this space. So we wanted to create a bridge between those two, those two groups of people who are thinking and considering uh, issues that face circularity all the time, but aren't necessarily communicating with one another. And then the last thing as we're incubating at the Said Business School is to think about opportunities for careers um, for people in the circular space after they leave Oxford. So both for students within the business school and within other departments in Oxford want to be able to emphasize the, the kind of widespread of careers that you can have that further the circular economy. And so um, this webinar falls within that first goal, which is to widen the profile of circular economy at the um, at the Oxford level and beyond. And we're really excited to have you here tonight to speak about these with these four amazing people um, about the constraints of data and design in the circular economy. So without further ado, I'll hand off to Shar who will lead this webinar. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alexis, for that amazing and warm welcome. Um, and so let me just add my warmth and my welcome to all of you that are joining us today on Facebook. Um, I want to start by just giving a massive shout out to Alexis, uh, to Hannah, to Maya, to Bella, to the entire Circular Economy Lab team. Um, they are doing some incredible work. And as you heard from Alexis's overview, um, there's some really exciting programming. And it is a real joy in, in my role as an entrepreneur and resident at uh, the Side Business School to be on this fun adventure with them and with all of you. Um, as Lexa said, we have like a super exciting conversation today that I think is really kind of tucking into some of the really important issues um, related to the circular economy and how we can accelerate a transition to it. And that is by looking at the important features of design and data and how they apply. And, you know, we do have a total dream team of speakers here tonight um, for all of you to listen to and to learn from. Um, I'm going to just quickly um, introduce very briefly each of them and then I'm going to turn it over to each of them to sort of spend a couple of minutes just explaining a little bit about who they are and their background. Um, first, I'm going to say that we've joined by Nikki from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Maybe Nikki can just give a little wave so people can see who you are. Uh, we also have Andy, who's the uh, founder and director of Green Lab Grow Spaces. We have Kate, uh, who's with Real Seed Collection, and we have Andy from EcoBricks. Uh, so you're going to be hearing from each of them in turn. Now, just to give you guys all a little bit of an orientation from the for the how we're going to spend our time, um, we've been brainstorming a lot of really exciting, important questions we think need to be asked, but we have a lot of content to go through. So what we're going to do is, again, just give each of them a chance to introduce themselves, and then we have selected one question, one really kind of tight burning question that we want to ask um, to each of them. So we'll go through those four questions in sequence. But please, while we're going through this, we need you to use the chat function because we would love to hear what questions you have. And we are going to very quickly as towards the end of the evening, turn it over to you and really kind of hear from you about what is on your mind. Um, so we'll pull out a few of those questions from the chat function and make sure we pose it to the speakers. I promise you, unfortunately, that we will not get to all of them, but I, we will be capturing those questions um, and making sure we have a sort of place where we can try and, and share some other answers if we don't have time tonight. Um, but that's enough for me. We got to definitely turn it over to our speakers. Um, and so what I'd like to do is start with Nikki, if I could, if I could ask you to come off mute 
and, uh, and introduce yourself. And what I'm going to ask you to do, which is a little bit now of a circular economy lab tradition, um, is to start by, by sharing what your go-to like power up song is. You're going into a big meeting or you've got a big day. What's the music you listen to, to, to get you going? And then, and then let's hear about what you're up to at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, good question. I think it would have to, the one that popped into my head at least is, I think it's called Girl on Fire. Is it Alicia Keys? Yeah, that's the one. That's a good power song. Um, hi everyone, my name's Nikki. It's a pleasure to be here. I work at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, and I'm in the data and metrics team. So we're doing a lot of work uh, around data and the circular economy. Um, I've worked uh, in various sustainability roles for the last five or so years and I came across the circular economy concept I think probably three years ago and it was really um, an aha moment for me of like wow this is you know really changing the system and not just doing things a little bit less badly. Um, so I was really hooked and I've kind of explored it from various roles um, in startups from an investment perspective and now um, working at one of the leading foundations um, doing research on the circular economy. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nikki, for that great introduction. And I know we're really excited to hear a little bit more from you around what is happening at the Ella MacArthur Foundation. Uh, Andy, I'm going to throw it over to you next. Same, uh, same question is an overview and just an introduction, but really importantly, starting with what that playlist song is that you'd like to sort of start your day with when you want to have the right sort of fire under your feet. Oh, and I should be clear, I'm going to direct this one to Andy um, from Green Lab Grow Spaces to start. Okay, thank you for thank you for the invite, and it's great to be here. Uh, I'm a big fan of Spanish music, so I listen to a lot of Spanish radio. In that I'm actually in the process of teaching myself to speak Spanish for various reasons. It's a song by Amaral, and it's uh, Nuestro Tiempo, which is our time. And that is, I guess, quite a powerful powerful track for me when I uh, need that, that kind of extra boost. Uh, in terms of Green Lab, we've been operating for about four years. My background is kind of Apple, Yahoo, bit of Google, British Telecom, Sky TV, founded Big Data Week, um, founded Fab Lab London. Green Labs are kind of the culmination of all my years of youth and gray hair, where it kind of brings together kind of closed loop circular design in the context of food systems, materials, and, um, and, and urban agriculture. We're based in Bermondsey. We've just gone into hibernation with the pandemic. And we're gonna reopen a thing in the next eight weeks in a similar site with about three and a half thousand square feet of lab space for early stage businesses and our focus is really around kind of closed loop systems certainly in the food systems so taking waste and turning it into food and so we're kind of hot on the heels of this kind of circular design across you know many different aspects which whether it be biomaterials organic materials seaweed to to put to um to plastic so i'm really looking forward to the uh, the thing this evening Terrific. Thank you so much, Andy. And I know we're all really excited to hear more about what you're working on. Um, and, and congratulations on the sort of great expansion of, of what you're up to. Um, great. I'm going to turn it over to our friend Kate, who's on the line. Kate, do you want to come off mute and introduce yourself and share your kind of power up song? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's really great to be here. It's really fun. And I think so many songs my one would have to be a song that I have heard sung by so many people in so many great and inspiring places, which is The World Turned Upside Down, um, sung basically by anyone other than Leon, Leon Russelson who wrote it. He's a fabulous songwriter, a terrible singer, but there are so many great versions, whether that's Billy Bragg, like Caesar Day, or just like, usually I, I hear it sung by people I'm with and it's a great song. So let's we'll start there. So yeah, thank you very much for being here. It's actually quite funny. My original background, I studied economics and I actually worked as an economist for a number of years in the nineties, mostly doing things around social exclusion, long-term unemployment, spending a lot of my time playing with data before big data was a thing. We used to like go and bully data out people, but then I gave it all up and I ran away to Spain in fact. And for the last 20 years, not in Spain anymore, I've been a seed grower. Um, I'm one of the founders of Real Seeds. Um, we are, in a narrow sense, we are a mail order seed company. We grow and sell vegetable seeds. 
but in the wider sense, our whole mission is about seed sovereignty more widely. It's about promoting the availability of good open pollinated seeds for people to grow. And it's about teaching them how they can then use those to grow their own seeds. So we're a slightly unusual company in that we spend a lot of time trying to stop our customers coming back to us. Um, like our mission is that you have our seeds, you go away and you don't need us anymore. That's what we do. Um, apart from that, um, the slightly unusual thing about real seeds is that we operate a totally flat pay structure. There's six of us and we all earn the same. That's kind of another principle that we don't do um, hierarchical pay structures. And in my spare time, when I'm not doing things with real seeds, I'm also one of the Wales coordinators of the Landworks Alliance, which is where I met Bella, who suggested I come along. Um, Landworks Alliance is a union of small scale producers. Um, my particular interest there is all around farmer to farmer skill share and social support. So yeah, that's what I do. Amazing. I feel like there's going to be such a rich conversation tonight. So many wonderful threads to weave together around this theme of circular economy, design, data. And I'm also like really picking up this sort of Spanish sort of groove. We might have to play a little bit of music later on. <laughs> All right, great. Well, last but certainly not least, and joining us uh, from 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 far away and in, in, in a dark space with the light shining through. Um, Andy, we're so pleased <laughs> you were able to make it. I understand you do have some power issues going on. Uh, so we, we, are, we are really, really pleased you were able to make it. Uh, but please, could you introduce yourself and, uh, and let's hear about what sort of music you're grooving to right now. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm calling from Masaka, Uganda, and unfortunately the power has gone out this evening. So I'm lit up as if I'm telling a ghost story with a solar light. But, um, but yeah, so the music I would listen to uh, to get me going would be, I like ska music, ska punk music. So it's a small band called The Mad Caddies and a song called uh, Road Rash. And just starts with an awesome beat that uh, just gets you up. And for me, I just, a little dance before a meeting is a, is a big win. Um, so that would be my song. And then a bit about me. Uh, uh, I'm not an academia. Uh, I didn't study anything to do with what I worked. In fact, I was a professional clown uh, for a while before I sort of started working in the sustainable development area uh, and moved out to Uganda uh, about five and a half years ago and set up uh, a few organizations here uh, and now uh, have established uh, EcoBricks as a co-founder. And there we recycle plastic and turn it into things of value, uh, trying to create green jobs as well as the environmental impact of recycling plastic. So yeah, that's what that's what we're all about. Oh, excellent. I have to say, I can already tell this is a really fun, playful, warm group. So again, I hope you guys are all getting your questions in on chat because we are watching those and we really want to make sure um, we're getting some of the great feedback and questions that you have that we can pose to this amazing group. I'm also going to say, um, if you also feel so inclined to share your own power up song, I think it's super fun that we can create almost a circular economy lab playlist. Certainly the ones we've heard today are going to be on it, but we would love to include yours as well. Um, so with that, actually, and before before we go into the first question, you know, Alexis, I am going to sort of put you on the spot a little bit here, if that's okay. So you get ready to unmute. But, you know, seeing as you're sort of doing so much of this incredible choreography and finding the way, way to sort of harmonize all sorts of incredible practitioners. I mean, I just really am keen to hear what what's your power up song for this week? Is there something that you've been playing a lot and getting ready for tonight? I spend all, almost every day of my life, which is maybe troubling, I wake up to the song You Can Call Me Al by Paul Simon, because my name is Alexis Al. It just brings me a lot of joy. So that's my power up song right now. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing, Alexis. I think uh, that makes sense, actually. You know, you can call me Al. I haven't heard that one. And I'll have to play that maybe, uh, maybe I'll play it soon. Great. Well, listen, we are spot on time. Look at that. Um, and ready to now tuck into sort of these one-to-one -one questions. Again, I'm just going to remind each of our incredible speakers that um, we you each are going to get one question to answer. And uh, I would just encourage you to think about sort of about 
three, four minute answer. Um, and then again, as we go through these four, please everyone else keep on sending in your, your questions through the, the Google chat function. So Nikki, we're gonna start with you. Um, and, and I think you know the work that you're doing at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the work you've done you know, over time, I think is just super interesting. And I think you know, this, this first question, I think it'd be interesting to explore together is you know, how you use data to, how do you, oh, sorry, let me start that. How do you use data to accelerate the transition to a circular economy? And I think, you know, what you've been learning and sort of appreciating and getting insight into are, are sort of the things that really work as well as the things we might want to watch out for. So Nikki, do you have any thoughts to share around, uh, around this question? I have a few thoughts. Um, so I think there's a really powerful role for data to play in accelerating the transition to a circular economy. And what we've really learned um, through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's network is that there's kind of this transition happening in circular economy of the concept is more or less developed. There's um, a common language that's been developed. People are kind of starting to understand what it means, what it could look like for them as a company or an organization. Um, and now there's really this need and desire to start implementing. Um, and even with things like the EU, uh, EU Green New Deal um, coming into play soon, I think, especially in Europe, there's this real focus on how do we actually start to implement um, these things and, and practice what we've been preaching about. So similarly at the foundation, we wanted to create this kind of shift to really um, help companies in that transition and to help them really become data driven and, and to understand where they are now um, so that they can set clear goals of where they wanna get to. Um, because I think really to implement anything, you need to be able to measure it. Sim similarly with climate change, there's been so much data made available by the IPCC and those data projections have really helped um, set realistic targets um, around the climate agenda. Um, so what we've done is created a very comprehensive circular economy assessment for the company level. Um, and that's quite a new thing that's been done. The foundation did a bit of work about five years ago um, on uh, measuring the circularity of materials and products. And we've used that learning and that um, knowledge as a uh, foundation to this uh, new tool that we've developed called Circulitics. Um, but Circulitics is very much focused at the whole company level. And there was really a demand from our network to be for companies to be able to assess this at the company level. Um, so what it looks like, uh, you can actually go on our website, circulitics.com, and we've got all of the methodology and the indicator questions and the definitions are freely accessible. Um, and the tool is also absolutely free to use for any companies. Um, and we've worked with a sounding board of uh, between, I think it's about 25 companies, uh, so large corporates from the foundation's network over the past year uh, to develop the methodology, develop the set of indicators um, that we really thought could assess the circularity of a company and um, get their feedback to make sure that our kind of thinking was really rooted and grounded in company reality. Um, so the, the tool looks like a, a set of indicator questions. We've split it in between two different categories called the enablers and the outcomes. The enablers um, questions are all about enabling conditions for the circular economy. And we thought this was really important because um, companies are quite early on in their transition to becoming more circular. And we wanted to reward companies that are really laying the groundwork that seems to be important to actually create the outcomes. But often as specifically for large companies, it can take a long time to really shift your material flows to, to becoming truly circular. So those enabling questions are around things like strategy and planning, innovation, um, people and skills, systems, processes and infrastructure, and then external engagement around your suppliers and your customers and policymakers. Um, and then on the outcome side, we have, um, I guess, more specific tangible questions around material flows. So the materials flowing in and out of your business, 
um, those in the biological cycle, those in the technical cycle, and how are they um, being treated in a circular way? And there's lots of kind of different options and you get more points for certain responses. Um, and we just, we've also tried to tailor it a little bit for different types of industries. So we've got these different industry archetypes which will receive different questions. So for example, if you're a purely service-based company, you wouldn't get questions about your material flows. If you're a financial institution, that's a completely different set of questions. So we've tried to make the most uh, kind of wide ranging comprehensive tool um, that we possibly could. Wow, amazing. I, what I'm hearing a lot is this idea of like really measuring the things that matter. Um, and I can't help but notice, Mickey, that in the background, you have this beautiful picture behind you of two herons and sort of the moon in the background. And it, it actually just does remind me of these um, these loop diagrams that I know are so important to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and its approach. Um, and just sort of listening to you talk about circulitics and, and knowing that this is a tool and a resource that's, that's uh, available and growing, I think is just a great contribution to the conversation. So thank you very much. And I'll do the little plug, which is for people that are interested in learning more, right? They can go to the website and, and yep. check it out and start seeing sort of a little bit more about sort of these indicators and, and how you're thinking about these enablers and, and the strategy side. So thank you. Um, I'm going to move now on to the next question. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask it of Andy and I'm going to say it's Andy with an E. Yeah. <laughs> Just to be clear, we got sort of Andy squared here tonight. Um, Andy, does the size of a business matter when it comes to enabling circular design? Um, I guess from my experience, I'd probably say no, but it's not, it's not as, it's a, it's not a binary process there's lots of gray areas and it also depends on I think the size and the stage at which the organization is developed to if you're a large multinational it's a lot more difficult or a lot more challenging to change your organization very quickly because a lot of income and processes people culture staff systems suppliers etc if you're a, say an SME up to um you know, not not a multinational, but on a, a slightly less mature perspective, you can make change quicker. But again, it again it's down to culture, people, process, and size. And if you're like a noob or a startup, um, I mean, we've seen a lot of people come through Green Lab, and they're single people. You know, one groups of one, two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen. They're making change very rapidly, very quickly because they can, and they're of the mindset. Um, and they've seen the damage that we've done to the planet. And the reason they're starting their businesses is to kind of mitigate some of the actions that the previous generation have made. And they make changes very quickly. The chain of, chain of command is literally, it's either one person or three or four. It's very short, the um, decision process. And so I think the size of the organization does matter, but actually it's, it's how they adopt and take on board the challenges I mean, if you look at um, a smaller set of organizations, they can do things like sharing resources amongst them within a community. And that's a really easy way to bring on board more of a kind of circular model, sharing tools, equipment, services, materials, ingredients, seeds. Um, that's, we've, we've seen that to be very, very effective. And a lot of it's down to mindset. You know, I was born in 1968 and I've got a few gray hairs here. So I'm kind of I'm 50s. So it depends on the generation that uh, to uh, try to tackle this. And from what I'm seeing, it's a much younger generation have grasped this and are driving it forward for the change. So I think also like tackling waste. Again, within a business, you can take the waste, you can turn coffee into face cream. That's part of a circular model. So it's thinking about different ways, different businesses can work together to put in practice, I think circular or like closed loop circular thinking. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, certainly for smaller businesses, in the like a more circular or you know sustainable mindset, is cash flow. You know, cash is king if you're a small business, and sometimes the decisions they make aren't in the best interest of a circular economy. But they sometimes have no choice. Yeah, they've got to survive, and right now they just want to survive given this pandemic. So there's some kind of economic imperatives that might might impede an organisation from making those changes. Even though the longer term gains might be there, short term might be quicker to use this 
product or use this service because they have no other option within their supply chain because the organizations they're working with are not necessarily part of that circular economy. So it's about being pragmatic as well. Uh, and things like Coca-Cola as a large organization, they've got incumbent you know, manufacturing processes. They have got enormous challenges, uh, phenomenal challenges. So it's, it's a global issue. Uh, for, for organizations that size, they're better off building a brand new factory to produce a more sustainable product rather than changing the existing factories or systems because it's far more cost effective. And it comes back to sometimes economics of making those changes within the organization. Although the changes you know, on that scale will be very beneficial. Um, so I think from, from the experience in working within the lab, the green lab, we've seen we focus mainly on kind of food related, insect related, algae, hydroponic, aquaponic. And all those systems are inherently circular because they're taking a waste material and producing, you know, a, a byproduct, whether it's animal stock feed, whether it's um, um, aquaculture feed, or whether it's food for humans. But again, much young, younger organisations can change a lot quicker, and they're having a lot, a lot much quicker, a much bigger impact, I think, and become almost like the poster child of the circular economy, you know, mindset and movement. So it really depends on the size of the organisation, but also the challenges vary from large to small so it's not it's not it's not it's it the answer is no but actually it's it's much more complex as a as a as a beast so to speak well well thank you andy i think that was a really quite rich and um and thoughtful response and i think just your initial framing and what what you brought it back to this idea that it's not binary that, that there's a gray space so it's hard to answer that question as a yes or no when there's different challenges and different opportunities depending on the size of your business so i uh, i wonder if that might be something we revisit a little bit later on in some of the questions uh but for now let's move it on to our next question and our next andy so andy with a y um andy with y i, I should be more sort of gracious in my Andy, uh, would you like to be able, would you be able to talk to us a little bit here tonight about um, how does the local context affect the journey towards a circular economy? And that can be at, at the country level, community level, uh, you know, the geography that's in place, but really like that contextual um, impact that an effect um, that that can have if, if, if an organization is on this transition towards a circular economy. Uh, yeah, so obviously being out in Uganda, we're in a very different culture to what many people find themselves in and their businesses in. Uh, and it's, I, I can't stress any more that it's 100% vital that you have the community buy-in uh, into a circular economy. Um, so otherwise, yeah, it just, especially in the context uh, we operate in, it just wouldn't work. So I can give examples of how we've been doing that here. Uh, so, for example, in recycling in different parts of the world, you actually have a service that you pay for for people to collect your, your waste, uh, whether that's through a tax system or whatever, but you have a service that you pay for. Uh, in Uganda, no one is going to pay for that service. It is way down the priority list of things that are, are needed in, in people's mindsets and their, their worries at home. So what we've done is we've changed our system and we buy every kg of plastic we get in uh, to recycle. And then we're adding the value. So that enables us to have 2,500 people that deliver plastic to us every single month uh, and earn extra income. So yeah, people come to us uh, from across Masaka. Uh, and then the second thing is that provides the motivation um, because we, we recognize that we do run an education program, but we recognize in the community we work in that uh, it is starting uh, from a different place. So it took generations for recycling and sorting plastic and washing your plastic and putting it in the right bin in, uh, in communities in the West to be, to be developed to that point. Uh, in Uganda, that is not, um, that would take a very long time for us to reach there. Uh, so we have sort of bypassed that by offering the motivation of money, which is the biggest motivator in the world. Um, so we are offered, we, yeah, we buy every single kg. Uh, we currently can get in up to 20 tons of plastic a month uh, and provide incomes through that. Uh, on top of that, we recognize that it's not just about the motivation, but it has to be convenient. So we ensure that the ability to do it is simple. Uh, again, back in, in different parts of the world, you can simply put it in the right bin and then it is taken for you. 
So what we've done is we've set up collection sites in markets and trading centers where people will gather anyway, and therefore they can bring their plastic with them um, when they're going to do their shop, uh, get instant cash reward for it, and then, and then complete their shop. So they're not going out of their way. It's not a struggle and an extra chore to, to be able to be a part of their our circular economy. Um, so that's something that I found really key. And what we found really works is having those two elements where in your community that you work in, you find what motivates that community and what can work. And also it's got to be convenient. It can't just be a motivation. It's got to be a convenient thing, which is, which is how we all shop um, anyway. We all focus on convenience and, and also what we want. Um, so, so that's what we're, what we're doing here. On top of that, uh, we also found that working with the local officials and uh, like local government here has made a huge difference. Um, they have a lot of sway and influence, uh, and we've been able to step in and be a part of a lot of the forums um, and elements they speak on. Uh, so we've been able to come in and advise in different levels in a local government setting, uh, which has been really, really helpful in bringing in the whole community as well. Uh, so we work with the top levels, and then our actual the people who deliver to us are also uh, some of the most vulnerable members of the community. So rather that we're not just focusing on one group, we focus throughout uh, the different uh, levels that we find in our community, um, which is which is great. Uh, and we actually ensure that 50% of our staff are from the disabled community, um, which is in, in Uganda notoriously one of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, on top of that, uh, we also recognize uh, the, yeah, that the sort of circular economy message is a big message, um, as lots of the others have touched on. It's, it's, it's not something that can happen overnight. Uh, so we do educational programs in schools as well, uh, where we focus our message on climate change um, and elements like that, uh, and reduce, reuse, and we also focus on refusing plastic. And then actually the last one is recycling. Uh, but that message there as well also helps bring in uh, to our circular economy. And then finally, we've also devised products that we can sell locally. Uh, we don't want a product that one, uh, when we've added the value to the plastic, we don't want this product to be something that is very nice and very environmentally friendly, but costs twice as much as what is on the market already. Because again, we go back to that, what is the biggest motivator? The biggest motivator, sadly, in the world is often money and people think with their pockets. So in our circular economy, the final product and the products that we, we create from the waste, we ensure are either cheaper or on the same competitive price as the competitors out there. Uh, so we have a concrete, uh, equivalent concrete mix that we sell at a cheaper price uh, than, than concrete is sold at here. Uh, so that's, that's how we do it. We've, we've looked at what's there. We find that, yeah, the, what, the, what is the biggest motivator? How can we make it convenient? And how can we engage all levels of the community and we found that to be a really effective way to, to get everyone's buy-in um, and we've brought in many different partners different religious groups uh, so we work with the muslim community we work with the christian community um, and we have many different groups that have stakeholders stakeholders like in our collection sites around massacre as well um, so it's been a yeah it's it's a huge community effort to to make ecobricks what it is and i think uh, 100% you've got to find what is the motivation in in your community that you're working in for, for anything to work. Wow, brilliant, Andy. I mean, you covered off so many points in that uh, in that few minutes. I mean, just really hearing about that experience you have in, in a local context. Uh, a local context and really sort of emphasizing again that need to really understand the different levels in the community, the motivation, the convenience levels. Um, and I, I just, I also really liked that idea of the, the, the hierarchy of use that you actually are using um, and, and how you're engaging people with it. So, so thank you for, for sharing the incredible stories. And, and, I'm, and I'm also really um, just grateful that you've been able to, to be with us and, and despite the, the context of the power and I'm, I'm glad we're hearing you loud and clear, which is, which is also great. So, uh, so thank you. All right, well, moving on to our last question before we turn it over to you and again, 
I am just going to say, please keep on putting your, your questions in the chat box. Um, Kate, this question is heading your way. And this question is, how do you think about competition and collaboration when it comes to designing a circular enterprise? And in particular, I think really understanding how you think about the ways in which you, you have to engage your consumers um, and other stakeholders actually in this design process. Okay, I was really happy that you asked me that question when I saw your four questions. And I'm actually going to start by answering the second half of your question, which is to say, I really hate the term consumers. And I think it's really important to remember that the distinction between producers and consumers is a very modern concept. And it's a deeply flawed concept. It's a concept which devalues whole sections of the economy. It buries a lot of work that is done, particularly by women. Um, and it's actually something that we really need to actually move away from or like lose it. <laughs> so that's particularly obvious in what we do. Um, obviously we, I send somebody seeds and they use those seeds to produce a food crop. So, you know, I'm the producer, they're the producer, but it's also the same if someone goes and buys food shop and they use it to produce a meal, you know. So I think if we want to promote the closed circle, closed cycle use of resources, we need to be aware of everybody's role as a producer, as a consumer in production and reproduction of our society. And I think that's just, you know, this kind of consumer society is obviously, we all know it's not working. Um, and so, once you start thinking about everybody's role as a producer, then it becomes about how do we all share information? And so at Real Seeds, we are aiming to give people information about how they can grow seeds. That's, you know, the, the professionalization of the seed trade, again, it's a very modern thing. If you go back, you know, in Britain, say 150 years, gardeners and farmers all saved their Seed. You didn't really have a professional seed trade. Still, obviously, in many, many countries of the world, saving your own seeds is the norm amongst the small scale farmers and growers. So why have we lost those skills in the UK? And so it's about sharing information, but also people pass information back to us. It's not a one way flow. We receive information from people. How do things grow? What are they like? how does packaging work for them? You know, we've gone over to paper packets. How does that work for them? Because there's storage issues and seed life issues. So once you move away from that producer consumer model, I think it becomes very clear then going to the first half of your question that we should not be thinking about a network of competing businesses, about compete, sorry, we shouldn't be thinking about competing businesses. What we are looking at is a social network of people aiming to achieve a certain aim. So in our field, that is a diverse and robust supply of seeds for sustainable vegetable production. You know, we are all a social network and that is what we need to build. We need to build that network. I mean, coming back very specifically to Real Seeds, something else that we do, we're working, the Gaia Foundation, um, the 18 Foundation, they have a seed sovereignty program. And so we work with them and we're trying to give the information that we've built up over 20 years about small scale seed production in Wales, which is a bit of a strange place to grow seeds, and share that with other people so that we can help build up, you know, people want seeds, we could grow real seeds, you know, we could be have like 10 times as many people, particularly now it's been insane in the pandemic. But that's not an appropriate model for what we do. It may be some things, it may be appropriate to be big, but for us, it works much better to be small, it's very much easier to do things on a sustainable level. And what we're trying to do is encourage a network of people who are all doing what we do, but also, sorry, I'm going to shout if I'm going too long, individuals and cooperative groups. So you may get more small enterprises, you can get cooperatives, you have individuals coming together and making non-professional seed circles. You know, it's all these different ways of achieving, achieving the aim. And I think that's what we have to think about for this kind of closed cycle. We're always in organic farming. You're always thinking about closed cycle. So it comes naturally, I think. But yeah, we have to think about social networks. And I would just like to throw in there to add to your power up songs, power up books, like, which is just a really nice thing. And I would like to recommend if anyone I'm old and like, 
Um, Andy, I'm in my 50s, it was a big, big book when I was young, The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, which imagines a utopian closed loop society. But there's also a great book by a guy called Matt Coward called Acts of Destruction, which is it's like, a, it's like an episode of the bill set in a utopian closed cycle circular economy society where it's, it's crazy. The police chase people on bicycles and the big thing is the theft of some tomato seeds. It's a great story. I'd recommend it. I love it. I love it, Kate. And and you've taken one of the questions, actually, um, that, that we actually had in our last week's webinar, um, and I was going to sneak in. So we must be on a similar wavelength here uh, this, this evening. Um, but before I throw it actually open to the group, um, I, I, I did just want to sort of reflect on, I think, this idea about it not being a, about competing businesses, but a social network. I think there is just actually um, it, 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 I, I really just want to sort of bring that out and, and really surface that because I think that's a really, really powerful insight. And it's a way of thinking. It's a mindset, um, kind of like Andy, the idea of not being binary in our approach or a mindset of constantly thinking about who are the community around us and how are they, what are their motivations and, and, and how are they thinking about the convenience factors. And, and Nikki, to your point, it's almost the mindset of how do we measure the things that, that really matter. So I, I did just want to reflect that for me in listening to this conversation with all your, your your, your respective words of wisdom, um, there is something here about the mindsets we really need to get into and, and that piece around, um, you know, creating social networks and, you know, picking up that word consumer, to be honest, um, I, I, I agree, we have to think uh, much more holistically. And that's why I, in, in, in the work that I'm interested in, this idea of stakeholder, which is someone who has a stake in the process or someone who has a stake in, in what's going on. And again, that isn't just the consumer. There are so many more people um, and, and organizations and generations that actually get um, are, are, are critical components of that. So, so thank you for really bringing that up. Um, and so Kate, I am gonna take sort of a moderator's privilege seeing as we have a couple of extra minutes here um, to, to ask the question to um, the three other speakers we have with us tonight. So you've shared your book um, and, and just for a moment, while Nikki and Andy and Andy maybe think about what their one book would be, I should say that the idea that came up in our first webinar series was to create some form of um, circular economy library. And so we have been collecting a series of, um, again, almost like desert island discs, like what's the one book or the one, you know, I'll expand it out, one piece of stimulus, video, TED Talk, uh, podcast um, that, that you feel really sort of inspires you and, and motivates you. Um, and, and again, if we could create sort of a, a little library for everyone who's on the line and other people who want to join us down the road, I, I think that's a really great way to capture sort of not just the musical energy of, of what motivates us, but actually also sort of intellectually, how are we processing what's happening and, and what, um, what helps us really understand these concepts. Um, so with that as being a bit of a preamble, uh, maybe what I'll do is ask, um, I'll, I'll ask Andy from Green Lab, would, would you be able to share, is there a book or a yeah, uh, stimulus? Oh, you got two. 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 Uh, uh, Ranulph Fiennes, Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know, mm. which is nothing to do with circular economy at all. But the book, The Third Plate by Dan Barber is one that's really, everybody should read that one. It's a fantastic read. It's about obviously our food systems. Brilliant. I think we will be making note of these uh, of these great resources. And I should say, you're right. It doesn't need to be about the circular economy. It's uh, just something that really stimulates your thinking as, as a leader in this space. Um, Nikki, can I come to you next? What are you, uh, what are you reading or what has really inspired you on your journey? Um, so I'll give one specifically on circular economy, which I guess is more of a classic, um, which is called Cradle to Cradle. Um, and it's about the cradle to cradle approach of design. Um, and then the other completely unrelated to circular economy that I'm reading at the moment, which I find very empowering as a woman to read is called Period Power. And it's all about the role of hormones um, in women. And it's really been just an eye opener for me. And I would definitely recommend it. Great. Well, thank you, Nikki. Um, two great resources. And we got two from Andy as well. Kate, I'm going to come back and let you add another one to your list as well. Um, Andy, Andy, uh, would you like to share what uh, what books or podcasts or TED Talks you find inspiring? Yeah, uh, a particularly good book is um, called Dead Aid. I don't, it's a fantastic read. Uh, and sort of shows how important sustainability and circular economy and building economies in general 
is is the way forward. Uh, that would be that would be my hot recommendation. Uh, I'm just going to go with the one. Uh, my other books are completely random, so. <laughs> Random's not bad. So if you did have one you wanted to add in, but I I, I, I think my favorite book of all time is The Alchemist. If you haven't read that one, it's a fantastic book of just following following your dreams and seeing where it takes you. So um, I really love that book. Great. I, I've got that one on my special bookshelf as well. Um, I, I imagine quite a few people do. So thank you for the reminder of a truly epic, <laughs> epic story. Uh, Kate, do you want to throw one more into the mix, seeing as everyone else got a chance to print two? Okay, well, my first one, yeah, as I say, was um, the one that I, I think I mentioned too. So you get Acts of Destruction, but the other one is an absolute classic, which everybody should read if they haven't, and it's called The Dispossessed. It's by Ursula Le Guin, and it's an imagination of an anarchist society on a very, very harsh planet, and it is just, yeah, it's, it's an absolute classic, and it's, it is the circular economy in action in a novel. Basically. Okay, that's right, because you would you'd give a novel as well. So thank you. We, we got some extra ones no there. Novels, actually. Oh, no. I mean, this is great. And this is what I love is actually that we just have this like really beautiful spectrum of different ways that people kind of can get inspired by um, all the different really interesting stuff that's out there. Um, different people have different creative stimulus and and i think what we're building up here is a really really interesting library um alexis maybe what you can do is in the closing round you can share what your resource is as well when you do your closing um great well listen let's move into some of the questions that you all have for our speakers um i've got a question here actually nikki one that's come in for you what happens if and when companies don't have enough knowledge or data about their own operations and cycles to accurately report the metrics and indicators Indicators that Circulitics calls for? Great question. Um, so you can still do the assessment if you don't have all of the data. Um, it will reflect, if you will get zero points for that question, obviously, and that will reflect in your score, but it's still very useful to go through the assessment and kind of understand um, maybe where your blind spots are and and learn from going through that assessment so i think it, it's still a valuable tool for everyone and uh, i don't think i mentioned the output of the assessment is a one-page scorecard with a breakdown um, of your score by the different themes of the assessment so you can kind of see where you're scoring more highly or or a little bit less less well and um at the moment, we while we're encouraging companies to disclose their scores, it's not um, a mandatory thing. And um, we've decided, obviously, having complete disclosure and open shared data is the dream. It would be extremely powerful in moving everything forward, um, especially in the investment community. Um, but at the moment, the circular economy as a market is still quite nascent. Um, and we don't want to discourage companies from using what is a very powerful um, assessment to understand what they can do internally and start those conversations internally. Um, we don't want to kind of dis, um, discourage companies from doing that if they might have not the best letter score, um, which they obviously wouldn't want to share out into the world yet, and they might not be ready to do that. Um, so yeah, I would still encourage everyone to um, take a look at the questions already, even if you don't feel like you're ready to do the full assessment, it's uh, really useful to kind of get your thinking going of what should we be looking at in our company if we're trying to really um, do this and, and go completely circular. Um, and then I'll also finally say that I think uh, there's always gonna be a bit of data asymmetry on materials, inputs and outputs. So most companies will have um, fairly good visibility on their the materials that they're procuring the products they're procuring um, it might be kind of a, a challenging exercise to um, engage with different suppliers and get all of that data in one centralized location um, but the data is essentially there and it's doable um, on the output side however that's probably a much bigger challenge especially for companies that are selling products um, directly rather than products as a service where they maintain ownership. Once that product goes out the door, it's very hard to know what's happening to it. So 
Um, we're seeing that a lot of companies doing the assessment are kind of using proxies where they don't have the data. So they might use the national recycling rates uh, for a certain material they're using if they don't have that exact data. And I think um, just because of the nature of it, it's fine to do that because we realize that it's very hard to keep track of everything that's going out. Great stuff. Thank you, Nikki. And, and I guess uh, um, I think if other questions are coming in for Nikki, please keep them coming through. Um, what we will do is we will try and collect them and, and send them your way, Nikki, um, so that uh, that you have on your radar some of the other things that are, are coming through in the in the chat function here. Um, the next question, actually, I think Kate is uh, is a great one for you. Um, the question is, do you think a model for business that doesn't center on profit, but a network of knowledge might discourage entrepreneurship? How do we change what entrepreneurship might mean to people? Okay, well, I have to say, I spend a lot of my time with market gardeners who are passionate people who work immensely long hours. Nobody does that for the money. No one does that at all for the money. It's like notorious for the fact that you can't even make a living at it. And I think I strongly suspect that every person on this call is not doing what they do in order to make money. I strongly suspect a lot of you could make a lot more money if you went and did something else. Um, so I think we have to be aware that actually money in situations of massive scarcity, like you're talking about in Uganda, Andy, obviously money is a motivator where people don't have enough, but it is not the main motivator for most people who are being entrepreneurs in the modern world. And actually, I think we need to be aware of that and we need to focus around life satisfaction, about meaning and about achieving things. And I think too often money has become a way of keeping score. Like as an entrepreneur, if your company makes lots of money, that's a way of keeping score and showing you're good. And we need to have new ways of doing that and acknowledging people's worth. And I think with the pandemic, this is a really interesting moment because people have started talking yet again. I mean, I know it happens periodically, like the way of economics, people were talking about universal basic in income in the 80s and then in the 90s and now they're talking about it again but it is I think every time it comes a little closer to say we're doing what we do to support our society and it's not about money and I think money is not actually in a situation of relative abundance it's not the greatest motivator. All right um do you know what I'm going to do? I, I think there's an interesting question to, I think to pick up on that and um and Andy and this is for Andy with why um, the question has actually come in. And it's a little bit about what you what future you foresee um, with a circular economy in Uganda. And I would say if you wanted to address some of the points that have come up um, in, in Kate's response, sort of welcome to he would love to hear your views on this. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, what I what I uh, see as a future in circular economy in Uganda is hopefully um, we can expand a lot on the on plastic recycling and turn it into a in-country where we process our own plastic. Uh, so historically it was being shipped out to India and China, um, but they have both pulled out of the market and now the international market has obviously collapsed in current times. Uh, and there it was being turned into, into fibers for clothing. But there is no reason why that couldn't happen in Uganda um, and then be a, a hub for East Africa to recycle at. Um, so I can see that happening. And I think there's the Uganda is the perfect location um, for East Africa as a as a good hub for for recycling as a whole. Uh, and then it, again, in the in the community we live in, people really use uh, like apart from plastic aside, a lot of waste is actually already reused. So people will compost um, uh, their organic waste because uh, lots of people work in agriculture. It's the it's the biggest employer. Um, and coffee is the biggest export. So it's a big, it's a big, big business. So a lot of it is sort of already embedded in the culture. Um, and then it's more that actually as we urbanize and different things happen across the world, that uh, those things are, are lost, which is the sad element. So hopefully um, we can see circular economy that is already taking place in Uganda continue to happen even as you know, sort of it starts to urbanize. But um, so yeah, circular economy, I think, I think will really take off. Uh, I think once a model is proven to be profitable uh, and then lots of, lots of entrepreneurs will step up and want to, want to be a part of it. Uh, Uganda's got one of the highest rates of entrepreneurship in the world. So um, I think it will, be, it will be big there. 
and yeah, definitely, I uh, completely agree with, um, like I've, I've set up uh, EcoBricks from point of privilege and that has enabled me to do it uh, out of passion. Um, so I completely agree for us uh, as, as founders, it's not about the monetary motivation um, when setting something up. And I yeah, completely agree with that. No one would be uh, in the industry I'm in if they were, if they were looking for money um, from, a, from a privileged uh, point of view. Um, so I completely agree with that that perspective, uh, but uh, but yeah, also recognise that it's the it's the community you're in, um, and still all across the world, people do uh, often think with their pockets when they're purchasing items. Um, so I think that that happens a lot, and a lot more people are starting to think environmentally. Uh, but if environmental things were cheaper, if it was possible to get to that stage where those things that are creating a circular economy and are creating fair wages and all those different things were actually able to compete um, with those uh, corporate giants then uh, then that would be incredible or the corporate giants change their practice but um but yeah that's uh hopefully that's maybe where we'll get to is that circular economy becomes uh, a forced practice on these uh, on these corporate giants i don't sadly i don't think they'll do it without uh, customer pressure well, well, thank you. We, we have just a few minutes left and I do want to see if I can sneak in one last question to Andy Green Lab. Um, there's a question that's come in about how does your corporate background, because you mentioned you'd worked at Yahoo and Google, influence the way that you run um, Green Lab? And, and I, I would just say we have just a few quick minutes for this response before I'll turn it over to Alexis to, to close us out. I imagine there's a lot of really wonderful stories to tell on this basis. I, th I think from my experience at Apple, British Telecom, working with Yahoo, um, there's there's an element of complacency around the the way you purchase and buy and operate and that you're working with a large infrastructure that has a standardized process and many things. Anything you change, changing a dial, changing a paperclip requires, you know, a change in a logistics process end to end. And to make those changes require significant effort, political will, because people are not prepared to make that change because it's too much effort for the gain. And so coming out of that world into kind of startup land for me was that I can, I can very much like Andy, you, you, I, I don't do it for the money. It's because I actually love what I do. Okay, there's a, the, we do generate some income, which is good, but it's more about being able to make a positive impact. And obviously looking back over my shoulder at a younger generation and give them a kind of platform to play in a space that's safe without too many commercial boundaries to generate new ideas for, I guess, a bold new world. Sounds like bloody Jack Picard from Star Trek. So it's really been a bit more, I guess, adventurous and not being afraid of making mistakes. And if we make them, you make them fast. Yeah, and then you can learn from your mistakes and move forward. Make a mistake, learn from it, do it again. So having spent too, too much time in corporate, I realize that now smaller organizations can be, become the bigger organizations and they start small and grow quickly because they can impact the planet a lot more effectively. What a great answer. Thank you. Um, we have one minute left. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Alexis, to close us out. Maybe you can share your favorite book and let us know about how and where we can keep on connecting in with these amazing conversations. But before I throw it to Alexis, just another huge thanks to all four of you for coming tonight, sharing your incredible stories. Uh, and we're so lucky to have the ability to hear from such incredible leaders doing amazing work when it comes to design and data in the circular economy. So a giant thank you for me here in London. And Alexis, over to you to close us out. Thanks so much, Char. Um, yeah, just to echo that, I just learned so much. It was so fascinating to hear stories from uh, such wide, um, such wide disciplines, and all embedding circularity, both in the way that you operate your your business models or your enterprise models, but also in the kind of philosophies that you you're bringing to to the workplace. Which I really appreciated the the discussion we had about about money and 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 what that means. So thank you so much for your time and your perspectives. Uh, thanks so much again to Shar for moderating. We really appreciate you as our as our champion, our faculty advisor. It's so so helpful to have you championing our cause. Um, and then of course to the CE lab members, really appreciate it. I think um, one thing that really came out was just that um, this the concept of circularity has a phenomenal power to restructure the way that we view our societies. Um, and this was something that we didn't mention at the the beginning of the webinar, but we just were very conscious of expressing our solidarity with the movements that are going on, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movements, the demonstrations in Oxford, the U.S. and beyond. And um, I just think that the circular economy has a phenomenal capacity to 
to restructure the way that we're thinking about our economy and the way that we relate to one another. So just to say a huge thank you so much to everyone um, for speaking tonight and for, uh, for your time and for everyone for tuning in. And um, if you're interested in learning more about the Circular Economy Lab, then please uh, follow our page on Facebook and we'll have some more webinars and some more exciting stuff coming up soon. So thank you so much.